Genesis chapter 45, and while you're turning there, I want to say a couple of things. Men, we're having a men's breakfast here in a couple of weeks. We have a men's ministry table that will be out there uh, next week. You've got to insert in your bulletin, and we're really excited about our men's ministry, and so we want you to be a part about, of that and think about it, and then next week uh, go to the table and find out all the things that are happening in men's ministry. And then um, we need help for our missionettes and Royal Rangers, and uh, it just takes a lot of volunteers, and those of you that you know that the Lord's already been speaking to you about, about helping, then you need to get out there and, and sign up and help and go by that booth, all right? And then the last thing is this. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a prayer seminar here. And uh, in all honesty, I'm going to make a real, real announcement to you next week about this. But in uh, two weeks, we're having a couple that comes in from Colorado Springs on a Sunday night. And they're going to share with us about prayer. But I want you to know, as your pastor, I have really been impressed by the Lord that a foundation of prayer needs to be laid in our church. And uh, that, that whole weekend is going to be about prayer. So we want you to start thinking about that. Uh, we'll have a, uh, we do have a booth out there, and you can go by and talk to Pastor Bob about the prayer seminar that's coming up, okay? All right, so you've all turned tonight, uh, you've all turned in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45, and we're going to talk about seasons of the heart, and tonight we're going to talk about summer. Everybody ready for some summer? And uh, we want to, we want to talk about what... It means biblically to be in summer from the life of Joseph. Uh, what are some of your memories that come to your mind when you think about summer? I really want you to think about this because I kind of want to get an atmosphere of summer going on in here this evening. And uh, I want to tell you some of my, my memories when I was growing up. I love summer. And the number one reason I love summer is because school was out. And uh, uh, my mom didn't appreciate it. <laughs> that I was out, but anyway, it was, that's the way it went, and uh, I loved, I loved everything about summer. Um, I loved, I loved playing, and this will really date me, but how many of you remember OTA? Six of us. Old Timers Association, and for a buck, you could, you could play baseball all summer and get a t-shirt. Such a deal. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we, we as a family did a lot of water skiing together. And uh, friends here that water skied with us, and, and it was just a hoot. Uh, vacations, summer camping, and all the rest of it. And then as I got older, some memories that really started coming into my mind were, were the songs that were being played during the summers that I was growing up. And I I just really can't get over that because every time I hear it on cool, whatever number it is on the radio station, I just, my feelings all come back about those summer times. So I put a little montage together for you to listen to some of my, uh, some of my songs during summer. So uh, hit it. Let's listen to this. You can sing along if you like. I hate pauses. Just hate them. There you go. Does that bring back some memories? Ooh. I'd dance, but you'd all leave. Don't you like that? Now, see, I could play that whole song. And I know it's church and everything else, but I, okay, keep going. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> We're in a hurry here. Yeah? It's okay. You can say yeah in this church. <laughs> I wish they had a picture right now of some of your faces. And then this one. I, I really don't appreciate this version of it, but you'll get it. 
Actually, <laughs> what happened? Oh, beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> beer, beer. Uh, I actually wanted to get some beach balls and throw them out and just have everybody <laughs> kind of lighten up tonight and let's have a good time. But I know that we, we need to talk about the Bible, so we'll, we'll get around to that. Um, Joseph will now enter a time uh, where some of his greatest memories in life will be made, and it's going to be during the summertime of his life. Joseph's gifting of dreams, receiving dreams, and not only receiving dreams, but interpreting dreams, really becomes the platform by which God is going to use to actually bring summertime into his life. And I want to, I want to just stop and kind of talk about this for a minute, because I think it's so important to understand that Joseph never got out of his area or his arena of gifting. And the reason why I want to bring that up is that I see this happen lots of times, not only in pastors, but I see it happen in people in their professions, where God has anointed them in a, in a certain area. And because of success that comes into their life, they feel like they can transfer those gifts into another arena of life, and it's just not true. When God has gifting for you, he says his giftings are without repentance. And when you find out what those are, you need to stay with whatever those giftings are because there is a platform by which God will use that to bring you into an area of life. And let me just tell you the story real quickly about Joseph. Joseph has interpreted um, the cupbearer and the baker's dreams now. He's had dreams of his own. And now Pharaoh. It seems like everywhere Joseph goes, people break out into dreams. And so he now is having, Pharaoh is having dreams, and he cannot find anybody. It's much like when we studied about Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar could not understand his dreams. And so the, the cupbearer tells uh, Pharaoh, hey, listen, there was a guy that told me about my dream when I was in prison, and he can probably tell you what your dream is all about. And the dream was that uh, Pharaoh kept having is he saw f seven fat cows and then he saw seven sin skinny cows. And then he said, saw seven uh, uh, kernels of wheat that were really uh, full and then seven kernels of wheat that were really um, withered. And so he couldn't figure it out. And so Joseph comes up to him and says, well, I'll tell you what it is. It's all in the same dream is that you're going to have seven years of fatness, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And Pharaoh goes, whoo, you're quite a guy. And promotes him to the second most uh, highest level of, of government within the Egypt uh, system during that day. And so Fa uh, Pharaoh sees this anointing on Joseph. Joseph has moved to a place because he has stayed in his gifting. Now I want you to hear this. It was in a moment's time, friends, that he goes from uh, springtime to summer. And I think that's really important for us to understand. That there are times in our lives when God is going to do something suddenly. And I love that. Don't you? When God does something suddenly. Now, most of the time he doesn't. But once in a while he'll do something really suddenly. And when this really begins to take place... Uh, Joseph recognizes brothers because his brothers now are in a, in a place in Israel where they have to come down and get food. And they do not recognize that Joseph has now been... They don't recognize him at all. And they come into this room and Joseph recognizes, re recognizes his brothers. And it's a really tender moment. And so Joseph has to turn himself away and kind of compose himself. And then he kind of treats him harshly, which I really don't understand a whole lot about. But in a moment's time, when they bow down to Joseph, he realizes his dream has come true. Just like that. It's like, wow, God really did speak something, and here my brothers are, and now I'm, I'm in the midst of abundance. I'm in the midst of summertime, which, by the way, friends, summertime and abundance really go hand in hand. And as a matter of fact, we'll talk about it here in just a minute, is that when God sends summertime, I think it's a visual for us to understand the abundance of God's economy. That God really is a, a God of abundance. And so uh, Joseph is recognizing that this thing is taking place right in front of him. And so uh, he sees and, and believes that his gifting is something that has been manifested by God. And it's really kind of hard to appreciate this 
But uh, Joseph really begins to think, I really believe this is the time that God is smiling on me. Have you ever, have you ever felt that? That there are just times in your life when, when it just seems like God is smiling on you. And you don't even know what you've done. I mean, and if we could figure it out, we'd put it in a three-ring binder and sell it and make a fortune, wouldn't we? But the idea of it is, is that we get in these times and we just recognize that God's, God's hand, for whatever reason, is just upon us and he's really smiling at us. And that brings up an interesting question. If, uh, if you were an artist, and I know that nobody could ever do this, but if you were an artist and you could draw the face of God, what kind of a look would he have on his face? concerning you what kind of a look would he have on his face concerning you would he be frowning would he be angry and and friends let me tell you something I don't want anybody to raise your hands this, this evening but I would guess that most of us in here would think that God is angry with us or is frowning at us most of the time and I want you to know that's not the way that God looks at us and that's one of the reasons why summer comes into, us, into our lives is so that we get a real glimpse of what actually is taking place here. Joseph is in a real time of blessing and he recognizes the smile of God is upon his life. And then I just want to share this with you. And if you go away from here tonight and you forget everything else that I say, I, I hope and I pray that this one will stick with you. That summertime represents joy. And one of the major characteristics of the Christian life is joy. And friends, I mean, there's, there's a whole study that needs to be done on the area of joy tonight. But when we get into these seasons, and it comes around to summertime, and we begin to recognize that there is this real joy in our lives because there's a sense of abundance it's not just for that season God is trying to say something to us that whether you're in winter whether you're in fall or whether you're in spring there can be a joy the joy of the Lord is our strength that no matter what we're going through but it seems like at a season's time and let me just say this to you there's a greater emphasis upon joy and it's to teach us that God wants us to look at him and view him as somebody that is happy and wants to have relationship with us and not frowning at us and wants to transport or transfuse or, you know, uh, bring us to a place in our life that there is this thing on the inside of us that's bubbling up that we recognize is just joy. And I, if I can just read some of your minds, some of you are going, man, that is so far away from me. I'm, I'm not there. I, I want you to know that one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. And God has joy for you. Regardless of what you're going through tonight, God has joy. So we're going to learn from Joseph's life tonight some of the things and characteristics that he had as summer came into his life. Don't turn here, but to Genesis 41, verse 9. I want to read this verse because it's after Joseph has now been made prominent and actually the famine has taken place. Uh, well, actually, the, the good time is in, and this is what it says about Joseph in verse 9. Joseph stored up a huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Now, to Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. Now, this is when his brothers are before him and all his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. I bet you he said, gotcha. No. Because they were terrified at his presence. In verse 4, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your younger brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. 
But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and, near, and be near me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brothers, Benjamin, and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Now down to verse 27. But when they told him everything, now this is speaking of Jacob. But when they told him everything, now they're, they're back in, in Canaan. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to him, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, now listen to this, the spirit of his father, Jacob, revived. If you have your little outlines, mint green outlines that the church has provided for, and you'd like to follow along, let's take a look at five signs of summer. Five signs of summer. Number one is this. God reminds us to be abundance thinkers. God reminds us to be abundance thinkers. And let me just read this to you in, in 41, 49 again. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Now, Joseph saw this dream that Pharaoh had, obviously when he prayed. God gave him an interpretation. He didn't even know what, Joseph had, or what Pharaoh had seen. And so Joseph sees what Pharaoh has seen. Now, this is really interesting here because God gives him. Now, think about this, friends. God gives to Joseph an image of the abundance that was going to come to Egypt. This wasn't Joseph's idea, which is really a key point. Is that when we come around to abundance ideas, you know, it's not just about the abundance that you and I think about. It's what God is saying to us. And for one reason or another, loved ones, think about this. For Americans, when we say one word, I mean, we have one thought when we think about abundance. It's materially. And God is so much more than that. Yeah, it does come around. And we are a nation that has been blessed like no other nation. You see? But there is so much more that God wants to do. And so when it comes down to this area of blessing in our life, in abundance, then we really need to begin to think, what kind of an image do I have in my own mind when it comes to abundant thinking? Do I really think about this God that I serve as an abundant God, or do I see him really holding on to things tightly? And see, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, another sign of a summer is, is gener generous or generosity. And God is really a generous God, you see. And so I want you to kind of go with me on a travel tonight, and I want you to challenge yourself and ask yourself about this whole abundance idea. Am I an abundance thinker, or am I, uh, you know, a scarcity thinker? Do I really think that there is, there is a God that wants not only to amply supply all of my needs, but wants, me, uh, wants to use me in such a way that I can, I can share with others? The generosity of God. Now think about this for a minute. And I, friends, I don't know how many galaxies there are. Let's just say there's 100 million. Just throw that out there. Would it make any difference if there were 90? Probably not. And then we, we are told that uh, there's probably billions of stars in each one of these galaxies. And then we, we start talking about space travel, and you measure it by years, light years. And how many... Billions of light years it takes to cross our universe. You know? Are you getting the message? I mean, we are talking about a God here that is not short in any kind of arena. He is just huge when it comes to abundance. 
There is no lack in God. That's why He is self-sufficient. And that's why it's a privilege for us to be a part of His kingdom is because He doesn't need us, but we sure need Him. You see? And so there's, there's this kind of abundance thinking. Now, we can think outwardly like that, but let's think inwardly for just a minute. And again, it, these numbers don't mean anything. It just means it's big. But I have heard there are like 17 trillion cells that compose our body. 17 trillion. That's about like our national debt. <laughs> it's huge, isn't it? But you just think of this. I mean, here's a God. That is not only, you know, can make things really big, but he can make things really small and put them in a really small space. And it just kind of blows your mind when you begin to think about this abundant God that we serve. And then, and then you know, just Jesus. Thinking about Jesus. And here's, here's 5,000 men. He's going to feed 5,000 men and all he have is, is uh, uh, two loaves and five fishes. And uh, he's going he's gonna to feed these guys. And he kind of tests the disciples and he goes, uh, you feed them. And the disciples go, man, there's no bakery around here that we can feed 5,000 guys. And by the way, friends, it's not just 5,000 men. It's the women and children. And so it probably puts the number up between fifteen to 20,000. He takes the bread and the fishes and he breaks it. And he blesses it. And the multiplication begins to take place. And he feeds everyone there. Now, now notice this. There's 12 baskets left over. Everybody's satisfied. You can have seconds if you want. You can have thirds if you want. Why is that? It's because God is an abundant God. Joseph recognizes the abundance that has come into his life is simply because God has ordained it. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. When an idea comes by your mind, and it could be the Spirit of God. It could be even someone challenging you about the gifts that you have, that you're to employ, whether it's into the body of Christ or out into the world. What is the first thought that comes to your mind? Is it, I don't have the time? I don't have the gifting? See? See? And friends, the simple fact of the matter is, is that when God gives gifts, it's not in short supply, it's in abundance. And he has not shorted you. And when that kind of invitation, when that kind of opportunity comes by, it's for us to think in these kind of terms. And just, just mark it down for whatever it's worth. Yes, God. I'm an abundant thinker. That's exactly what Joseph did. He was an abundant thinker. You can accomplish this. Number two is this. Gratitude emerges during summer. Gratitude emerges during summer. Now this is verse 5, not verse 51. Verse 5. And do not be distressed. Now this is Joseph talking to his brothers. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Joseph must have, must have had an attitude of gratitude because he does see how God used his life to bring about good. How many of us have heard, and I'm sure all of us uh, have heard this example about um, when you see the glass half full or half empty? You know? Well, Joseph must have been a guy that saw the glass half full. That he saw really negative circumstances that were going on in his life, but was going, God's going to work something good out of this. Now, here's what happens to us, friends. And let me just say this. And, and I, am not trying to, uh, I am not trying to condemn anyone in here. And when I speak uh, to you about situations like this, I want you to know I get it first. But we, of all people on the planet, should be the most grateful and not the most complaining. And yet it seems to be that when we go through difficult times, the first question that comes out of our mouth is, why, God? Why am I going through this? And yet it seems to be that Joseph here is really exuding a whole lot of gratitude in his life, which really brings us down to this whole idea of thanksgiving. 
and letting thanksgiving come from our lips regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I know that it's really difficult. I know that when you get to these areas in your life and you have to say, God, uh, you know, I'm going to thank you, not particularly for the suffering that I might be going through right now, but I'm going to thank you because of, I know that you're going to bring something really good out of this. And 1 Thessalonians 5.18 really does kind of speak to this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And friends, I have taught this for years. I believe the emphasis is on giving the thanks and not the circumstances. You give thanks. And really, the giving of thanks really becomes kind of a barometer as to where we are in our trust factor and our relationship with the Lord. When we're going through really difficult times, you measure it for yourself. Are you a thankful person knowing that God's going to bring about something good? And it's interesting to note that in this particular situation here where Joseph finds himself, he is in a time of famine. But there's a time of abundance around him. And so I want you to think about this this week. I want you to think about giving thanks to God regardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in. And just see if there's an attitude change that comes with that whole idea of saying, God, even though I don't understand, I'm still going to give you thanks because I know you're worthy of it. I don't know if you've ever heard of this person, uh, Murray Salem, uh, but she's an a actor and a songwriter, and, and she said this, or a, a screenwriter. I just want to give you... a. Um, a story that I found. My parental grandmother, long since passed away, was simple. Syrian peasant woman who could neither read nor write, yet she was devoutly religious. No matter what she was doing, God was always on her lips. But more than just his name, she would say, thank you, God, thank you, God, at least a hundred times a day. And not just when good things happened. The soup would boil over, making a terrible mess. And she'd clean it up, and she would be saying, Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And at that time, it seemed very bizarre to me, since she insisted that I do it too. I'd scrape my knee, and she'd tell me to say, Thank you, God. Oddly enough, it seemed to work, and my knee would feel a little bit better. Well, then I turned five and started school. And since I was from an ethnic background, the blue-eyed, blonde-haired kid used to make fun of me. Because of my dark complexion, they called me cruel names. I hated school. And I begged my parents not to make me go anymore. They felt bad for me. But they couldn't protect me forever. Then my grandmother heard what was happening and told me that I should say, Thank you, God, every time the kids called me horrible names. At that time, I thought that was the dumbest suggestion I had ever heard. But a few days after she talked to me, when a whole group of boys shouted names at me, something happened. I was holding back the tears, trying with every ounce of strength in my body not to be a sissy and let them see me cry. But I couldn't stop myself. The tears were going to burst out anyway. Then I remembered Grandma's, thank you, God. I started repeating it silently to myself. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It helped. I don't know exactly what happened, but the tears subsided. Suddenly, I didn't care so much what they thought. Maybe that's because I felt that now I had a friend, God. Well, that was all a very long time ago. Since then, I've become a successful screenwriter. I've traveled the world and met hundreds of wonderful people. My life is more than I ever expected. And through it all, I kept on saying, Thank you, God. Sometimes I say it a hundred times a day, like my dear grandmother. I even feel like saying it now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Joseph was in a time of famine, but he found gratitude. Summer is a time for us to say, thank you, God. And I want us to all say it together so we get into practice. So at the count of three, we're all going to say, thank you, God. One, two, three. Thank you, God. And we're going to just keep saying that and watch the atmosphere around us change this next week. Number three is this. 
Generosity is the best response to summer's bounty. Generosity is the best response to summer's bounty. Verse 11. I will provide for you there. Now this is Joseph speaking. Because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Because Joseph has an abundance mentality. And let me just say this now friends. And I hope this will will mean something to you. Because Joseph has an abundance mentality. And I want you to know that abundance mentality is inward. It's inward. It's where we really have to do the battle about the scarcity thinking. But because Joseph now has an abundant mentality, he is now going to exhibit generosity. Sad to say, but the opposite is true. When we have a scarcity mentality, we will not exhibit generosity. And there's a whole teaching within the Bible of what God calls generosity. What is the minimum amount of generosity? And we are talking here about finances. But this is not a finance message, obviously. But it is something that we all need to consider. Is that at the bottom of a scarcity mentality, there are two realities that are known to man. Number one is this. Fear. I will not have enough for myself. And friends, let me tell you something. There is no other weapon. There is no other issue in your life or in my life, that this scarcity mentality confronts us like the area of money. And that's why Jesus talks about money more than he does about heaven and hell. Because money has the ability to make you worship it. Bow down to it. I want you to know right here in River City tonight, there are people that are selling their bodies for money. See? See? I mean, this thing is just as real. And God says, I want you to learn about generosity. I want you to learn that there is something that I want to do. As a matter of fact, the scripture I'm going to quote to you tonight is from Malachi. And in Malachi, God is talking about the the people of God. And he's talking about money. And he's saying, the reason why you are destitute is because you are robbing me. Now, that is an interesting phrase that God would speak to the prophet Malachi that you are robbing me. How do you rob someone that has everything? That's a wonderful question, isn't it? I mean, God has it all. If he doesn't, he can create it. What a God. You're a tough crowd tonight. Uh, But here's how you rob God. Is that when you do not practice generosity, then God is not able to give back to you. See? And it all comes back to this scarcity mentality. And let me just put out a, you know, a, a disclaimer out here. The church is not hurting for finances, and this is not a message for finances. This is something that all of us have to confront on a level of our own personal life and recognize that God says, and it's the only place in Scriptures, friends, it's the only place in Scriptures that you can go and find out that God says, test me in this. Test me. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven so wide and pour out such a blessing to you that you will not be able to handle what I pour out. That's that's pretty amazing. When you realize that we're talking about this abundant God that we described in point number one. That he is saying to us, I want you to try me in this. Test me and see if it doesn't work. You know, and I, I don't really like to talk a lot about Jeremiah's personal life. But once in a while it is necessary. And I, I just want you to know this. Ever since, when we, when we got married, it was not even issue in our lives whether we were going to tithe or not. And that's, that's the wonderful thing about having a mate that has the same kind of heart that you do. And we can actually testify to you tonight that God has met us at every juncture of our lives financially. You see, and God says, I want to bless you in ways that you will not believe if you will understand this principle that when summertime comes to your life and there is an abundance there, I want to pass it right through you. You know why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Is because it has, you know, rivers that run into it, but there's nothing that runs out of it. 
And the reason why people are stagnant in their life, and let me, let me, just, let me just be really bold tonight. The reason why some of you have stagnated in your growth is simply because you will not open up the other end, and it's a trust issue. It's a scarcity mentality that God really wants to challenge you on, you see. He wants to bring good things into your life. But first of all, what we have to recognize is that the principle of the universe is already there. How we enact it is by being obedient to what he said. And I just, you know, I, I've, I've just watched it in people's lives. I can't tithe. And then watch them tithe and then come back years later and say, I can't afford not to. And, and, you know, and I, I say this lots of times, and I really believe it to be true. Um, you partnered with God in 90% can accomplish a lot more than you keeping it all at 100% without God in your finances. You see? Generosity. And that's what, what uh, Joseph was doing. I'll provide for you. Because he has an abundance mentality and now he's going to show generosity. And that's what, that's what summer's all about. It's abundance. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things that I thought about was, was this. And I know that it's happened to a lot of people in this. Uh, people that have uh, gardens, their own private gardens, and about this time of year, I know that there are people that sneak around with tomatoes all packaged up and throw it in your back seat because they've got what? An abundance. And the other one vegetable that they always put in with it? There you go. I have a theory about that. Not very many people eat zucchini. <laughs> That's why there's so much of it. Anyway, number f- point number four. Practice recreation and regeneration in the summer season. You like that one? Practice recreation and regeneration in the summer season. Now listen to this in verse 27. This is biblical, people. I mean, I am not, this is not Shakespeare this evening. This is God-inspired word. Listen to this, ver- verse 27. But when they told him, now this is speaking of Jacob, when they told him everything, Joseph had said to them, when he saw the carts Joseph had sent back to carry him back, the spirit of, the fa- of their father Jacob revived. The word revived means to give life or restore or renew. It's being renewed. He is looking forward. Now think about this. The last time that we really saw Jacob, he was saying, leave me alone. I'm going to mourn and that's the way I'm going to go to the grave. And now the summertime has come into his son's life and now summer has spread on to, to his life and he is now looking forward to the future with optimism. See? That's what summer does. Hey, you know, when you thaw out a little bit, you think, man, I can take fall and winter once again. You know, it kind of gives you that optimism about what's going on. Is that, you know, you kind of want to see the cool weather come around. And so God is doing this kind of incredible work within uh, Jacob, and he is reviving, and he is actually doing something that's bringing hope and optimism, which really has this whole idea of of recreation in it. Now, I want to say something and, and give another disclaimer here. Because we are a society that is really bent on having our whole focus around recreation, lots of times when that becomes your focus, it actually becomes a wearying point. You become exhausted in it. And you know why? Because it's really hard to have fun all the time. You were not created to have fun all the time. But you were, at points, you know, spoken to, to have moments away. To recreate, to recreate, to rethink. I was at a pastor's conference here back in July, and a friend of mine from another church, she's been in the ministry for quite some time, she came up, and um, for whatever reason said, uh, you're a survivor, tell me how you did it. And, uh, and so we just started talking about how do you survive? How, do, how, do you, how is there sustainability in anything that you do? How do you sustain it? And uh, so I asked her, I said, and I called her by name, and I said, uh, what do you do for recreation? And she looked at me and she goes, nobody has ever asked me that question. I really don't know. I forgot what I enjoyed doing. 
And I said, you know, if you don't find something that you really enjoy doing, you probably won't sustain ministry. Matter of fact, you won't sustain anything. Um, it's, it's really interesting, friends, to find out that when you take time off and really find something you enjoy doing, that when you come back from that time away, from that time of, of just drop. Let me just say something to you that's about myself that is not good at all. I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I live by a schedule. Drives my wife nuts. Um, probably drives the staff nuts, too. I don't care. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean to tell you, it, it is... It is. I mean, we leave right on time, We're, you know, and it's just, and, and that's the way I get things done. I mean, I am goal-oriented. I'm, I'm, we're going to be there. We're going to get this done, and this is how we're going to do it, and all the rest of it, and be in the car. That doesn't always work, so don't use that. But anyway, I find out about myself, this to be very true, that a schedule becomes very monotonous. Very monotonous. And you cannot sustain any kind of life. And I don't care what profession you're in without some kind of recreation in your life. I mean, you should be standing on your pews right now shouting, Hallelujah, man. We have got a preacher up there that's telling me to recreate. But I am saying to you to do it in balance. Don't let it become the focal point of your life because the whole idea of it is, is to be rested to do what Jesus wants us to do. Not to throw it out to some kind of an extreme to where we, we miss all the things that God has for us about being in this church and doing His work. But I even notice it in myself when I come back from a time of recreation. My problems seem a lot smaller. You know? The, the mountains that I thought were so big are just now in perspective. And one of the reasons why is now it's in perspective because I'm not so emotionally distraught and weary. And let me just say this to you. One of the reasons why people fail in their lives, in their walk with God, is not because they're not having a good quiet time, and it's not because they're not eating the right things. It's because they're not watching the emotional gauge in their life, and they're running on empty. And the only way you can get your emotions back is to be a way. Number five. It just doesn't get any better than that. That's all I can do, guys. Number five. Celebration springs forth from summer, or when summer finally appears. Celebration springs forth when summer finally appears. Verse 14. Wow, I didn't know it was that late. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. Joseph has experienced a family reunion, and it's where everybody likes everybody. <laughs> all of us are created with the need to celebrate. And when we don't experience celebration, we lose our joy. Celebration means to mark as an anniversary by festivities or, or deviation from routine. God wants us to come together as a family and celebrate His goodness. That's what we're doing, friends. This is the time of celebration. As a matter of fact, uh, worship team, come on up. Celebration has to do with an attitude of heart that really is a choice, not something that is forced. In other words, listen to this, friends. If, if someone can force you to celebrate, if some kind of external uh, pressure on you actually gets you to, then your heart is not in it. And God does not want you to celebrate that way. God wants us to celebrate simply because we have something to celebrate about this God that we serve. And when people say, and I just want to be really honest with you, and I know I'm over time and all the rest of it, but I just want to say this to you. It really concerns me when people come into this place and they do not find a reason to celebrate with the family of God. It concerns me. And here's the reason why it concerns me. is because if you don't learn to celebrate the right things, you will learn to celebrate the wrong things. And celebration is such a, a need in our lives that when we do not celebrate, something goes down. But when we come together, and I am not talking about excitement, friends. I'm talking about something that goes off in us and says, you know, God, I'm going to celebrate you because you've been so good to me. 
You filled my life with such good things. I'm going to celebrate you. And you just have hundreds of things, friends, that we could celebrate God for. And so I want you to stand. Because the way we're going to end the service tonight is we're going to celebrate, and it's your choice. It's your choice whether you want to clap your hands. It's your choice whether you want to celebrate. But I want you to know God gets a blessing out of our lives when we choose to celebrate Him from our hearts. Let's worship the Lord. Celebrate the Lord. It's the time of bounty.